Thank you so much. Uh, I know you've prepared the whole work, so I think we'll take one moment at a time, if that's OK. Is that, I mean, it's really wonderful playing. I, th I think we'll all agree this is really um, amazing playing. In a sense, you don't need me to say anything at all. I, it feels very, very ready. Have you performed it already? Or, yeah, we've yeah. performed it once, yes. Yeah, I mean, it feels like a sort of lived-in interpretation and, and yeah, yeah. very compelling and, and yeah, <laughs> wonderful things from you individually and, and collectively. So. Uh, thank you so much for that, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the trio, actually. Um, it's, in a way, it's a shame we can't see the landscape behind us, because I, I was walking um, just sort of nearby this morning um, and sort of trying to imagine, you know, Beethoven gained so much inspiration from, from nature and from walking, um, and I was just sort of trying to imagine, you know, what it must have been like to be having these sort of flashes of inspiration. And there is something I think we can take from this amazing natural landscape, something of the, the sort of ruggedness and the rawness and, and the nature inspiration that I w was very much on my mind today, just being in this amazing place. Um, and I think one thing is sometimes, uh, some of the things you do almost feel sort of too refined, but there's, there's something really raw about this music. And I thought we might just talk to the audience a bit about this piece and what its sort of extraordinary um, uh, defining features are. So um, this is uh, Opus One, um, which I suppose might lead people to think it's the first thing Beethoven wrote. Um, Obviously, yeah, it would be very hard to write this having not written it. So, so what, what, do, what do you know about this piece, or what, what could we tell the audience that... that um it, was, it wasn't very well received when it was performed for the first time. Yes. I mean, Haydn heard the... Haydn, 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 yeah, and, and Haydn heard it. I heard it. Yeah. He, was, he liked the first two of the uh, opposite yeah. one, number one and number two, but the third one, I think... That. <laughs> he really didn't think that was going to have any success. Yeah, I think he was worried about what the public would think. Yeah, yeah, because and I think this is, yeah, maybe, as you said, this is very raw and very yeah. almost uh, unpolite. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and I think it's, uh, so his Opus 1 was really not, not, not at all the first pieces he wrote. It, he was about 25 at the time. Um, but I think the pieces with which he decided, okay, I'm going to announce myself to the world, now I'm ready, you know, and, and of course he had aspirations not only as a composer but as a virtuoso pianist, so it's very much for, for himself as well. Um, but I think, yeah, so he wrote this set of three trios, and so the first two are in major keys, and they're amazing, and they're, and they're, they're something new, but they're still within the classical boundaries. And with this, it's like he sort of breaks everything down. Yeah. There's so much that I think is beyond the realms of what anyone expected from a piano trio at the time. Um, for example, the fact it has four movements actually in itself yeah. differentiates it from, and from Haydn idea. and Mozart. Yeah. And another big feature that differentiates it from what's gone before would be in terms of independence of parts. Oh, okay. Um, well. well, Joel is a cellist usually. Oh, I see, sorry, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I have more to do than in a Haydn tree. Much, <laughs> much more. <laughs> so but before this time, the cello had been principally used um, to double the bass line of the piano. That's very true in Haydn trios, and also in Mozart. And actually, it, it, these are the first trios where it really becomes an independent, equal voice. You know, that just even giving the major melodies to the cello at the time was, was really a, a sort of new departure. Um, and then there's this key of C minor, which is a particularly powerful key for Beethoven. Um, and I mean, well, you, you, we can tell, what, what are the other sort of iconic Beethoven C minor? Fifth Symphony. Fifth Symphony, yeah. Yeah, the third piano concerto. Yeah, the third piano concerto. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, string quartet, I think. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, opus 111. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, what, what sort of um, features do all these works have? I mean, what, what do you think this key means to Beethoven? Mm. Well, hmm? Dark. Yeah, it's darkness. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And also, in a, like, uh, isn't this 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 mod is this um, fate? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think there is something sort of yeah. elemental in this sense yeah. of fate. So I think although this is an early work, it's so looking forward to yeah, yeah. his middle period, to the sort of heroic middle period works. And I think we have to sort of see it in that light that yeah. he's 
it would have been shocking to the to the audience. And you know, the fact that Haydn may or may not have walked out and said, you know, <laughs> you shouldn't publish this. I think it might be slightly apocryphal because apparently it was actually already published by then. Oh, okay. So, um, but even so, I think it was. Yeah, I I think we could just find more of that. You know, because we know these pieces so well that. I think we kind of forget sometimes to be surprised by them ourselves. But I think there are times when even just in the way you play with silence, um, I think there's such a sort of foreboding and such a tension from the first bars of this piece that it never wants to feel too, too ordinary or too normal or too like we know what to expect. So I wonder if we can just, just take it from the top again and then just, um, yeah, see, see what we can find in terms of the, the sort of pregnancy of these pauses. And, yeah. <laughs> So already, I wonder if the sound is too normal. It's almost too expressive that it's, it's such a strange opening. And so it's very much like the um, Mozart C minor piano concerto, isn't it? It's same interval to start with and this sort of mysterious unison. And I, I don't know if that's, that's a sort of deliberate or, or not, but, um, but maybe it has that same sort of sense of mystery. And in the sound, there's something that's not quite so warm, maybe, that it, it could, yeah, just, just to experiment. And then already, pianissimo, you know, there are so many extremes in this. Already in the first page, we've got all these short sounders littered everywhere. We've got pianissimo in the fifth bar, you know, which is, is an extreme dynamic to play to. Yeah. <laughs> something about the first note sort of feels too precise the way it starts that it it's like a door opening on this mysterious world that <laughs> It's already better. I think one thing we always have to remember with, with Beethoven and with these great classical composers is they were amazing improvisers. You know, that was so much sort of part of the musician's toolkit at that point. And, you know, Be Beethoven and Mozart, and they, they were, yeah, amazing improvisers. And I think there's something so exploratory and improvisatory about this, this opening that I think we have to imagine Beethoven just being sort of struck by this inspiration in the moment. So, yeah, even... Even this little sort of cadenza, you know, already by bar, bar nine, <laughs> there's a cadenza. So it's already sort of so looking forward. But I think, yeah, if you can find something really improvisatory that we, don't, we really don't know what's coming. And even the way the first bar connects to the second bar, I think there's some sort of growth just following the contours of the line. So, yeah. What, once more. <laughs> Actually, what if that stayed within pianissimo, that we're still, you know, I think in Beethoven there's a huge difference between piano and pianissimo. I mean, pianos are often, you know, actually quite an outward expressive dynamic. In pianissimo there's something, yeah, there's something so sort of orchestral about this piece. And so I think it really does need those, those extremes at either end. So maybe this pianissimo can, can carry on right through to, to then this, this next figure. Um, so it's just even, even stranger and even more arresting. Once more and then go over.
okay, great. So, I mean, already we've had this whole sort of world of, of drama and of, um, yeah, this sort of explosive and dark quality. I wonder if there can be sort of even more tension in the yapapapa. Yeah. It, it feels almost sort of too comfortable. There's something, I think we can almost sort of feel this hemiola a bit more. You know how it's, how it's sort of barred as if it was 6-8 in a way. Just yapapapa, yapapapa. But there's something sort of more unsettled about it that I think we can really feel that middle of the bar. Yapapapa, yapapapa. And just this more sense of sort of intent from the start, you know, just, yeah. Um, just make sure in the opening, just that always the ornaments are um, integrated into the melodic, melodic line. It's not sort of a melody and then a, then a turn um, sort of on top. It, it's very much part of the melody. And I think even in this violin mini cadenza, just that it really, yeah, it's all integrated. We, sometimes we just sort of see a trill and we kind of add it on, but actually it's all part of this. So yeah, one, once more from the top. I, I'm still not convinced by your very first note, that it, it feels sort of almost too casual, like, yeah, this sort of pregnant silence. <laughs> Yeah, one thing, so, sorry, I keep, there's just so much in this first phrase. One of the things I'm thinking about is your appoggiaturas, so, or, or, or just, just these slurs. I sort of want to feel more on the first note, and actually that's true in the cadenza as well. I think the A natural is the expressive note, which resolves to the G, so at the moment I'm hearing more of the resolution. There's something very vocal about these, and I think then in the piano part in the next phrase, it's that first note that's really the, the expressive, expressive note. So. Yeah. Um, so also in our accompaniment, yeah, the same in in bar eleven. Oi. Oi. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Beautiful. I, there, there are a lot of great things there. Just uh, where we, we go into A flat and then this really sort of remote, remote keys. I, mean, I think one of the most amazing things about this piece is how remote the keys he goes into so quickly, right? So I think just if we can find always, always strive for new colors. And, you know, there are so many colors that we, we've got to think, you know, we've, we haven't been to this region before. You know, this is really uncharted territory. And I think to really do as much as we can with color. You know, imagine you've got a whole orchestral palette, you know, woodwind solos, or from, for everything from full strings to a, a solo flute. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that moment is so unexpected then, you know, when we're sort of in this sort of Neapolitan territory and we're in E flat minor, you know, like within about 20 bars of a C minor movement. So, I mean, it's, it's really, really strange. And I think this, say, around 43, this is where we can really sort of feel this hemiola even more, that it's almost like we're in 6-8, and this sort of constant not quite meshing, which is so much about Beethoven, and, you know, I, I think there's all, all these sort of rhythmic tensions and, and the way he, he displaces beats and everything can be 
yeah, just, just more arresting. Um, should we go from the A-flat, from, from the, yeah. <laughs> So then I think, Yixing, this needs to be just more glorious. And this is, you know, we've had all this sort of tension and this, this craziness. And then this is so lyrical. I mean, and this is the thing Beethoven does so wonderfully in these, these dark moments. And we'll, we'll come to this more in the second moment. But he does find these amazing moments of, of, of peace and of, of tranquility and of lyricism. That It's so beautiful the way that just emerges from all this chaos and then... Yeah, I think it can be really sort of vocal. And sometimes I, I think you play so beautifully and so sort of evenly, but actually these expressive lines can sort of sing even more and really follow the contours. Just imagine how a, how a soprano would sing that line, and I think you'll find even more freedom. Um, shall we ju just? It's always good to do transitions, so let, uh, why don't we play um, 47 and then, then going into the, into the second subject. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, beautiful, oh, but you played the same phrase, you, exactly the same the second time. So I think just always that there's a sense of journey, that there's, there's that, yeah, we, we never just sort of repeat, you just find something new. Um, yeah, beautiful. I think the, the, the transition into it can be even more sort of meltingly beautiful, you know. It, it's so, so quick that that happens, but it's, it's so exquisite, the way the three of you in, in, in trio um, with, with the piano in, in the inside of the texture. So you have to become one voice and just, just melt into that lyricism of the second subject. Um, same place again? <laughs> So the, the peak of the phrase, you om nom so at the moment it feels a bit sort of first beat heavy, but that's really the, the crest of the, of the phrase. So just even more generous, I think. So, um, you don't have to go as far back, but to where if there are. Just sometimes I think you don't always make clear actually in the balance between you where the principal voice is going. So I think, Erica, where you take over there, I'd, I'd have loved to have heard you become the sort of prima voce a bit more, actually. Um, there was another place a bit like that earlier on. But uh, yeah, just, just I think you can really then take, yeah, be more aware of where you're passing the, the, the principal voice to, I think. Um, and again, because we're in A flat major now, just again, a different color, a different, different harmony. Um, straight on the second subject, maybe? <laughs> Thank you. 
and here, this sort of second part of the second subject. I mean, we, we should always be expressive, but actually here he writes Espressivo very specifically, and with, even with a dotted line, that he obviously wants something even more than you would normally do. So I, I think there is something really um, so songful and so expressive about this. You know, firstly the violin phrase in the major, and then this kind of heartbreaking minor version. You know, again, A flat, A flat minor, E flat minor. You know, these harmonies are so remote, I think. You know, there's something really extraordinary going on, and it just it feels too commonplace in a way. I mean, it's beautiful how you're doing, but it, I, I think it can be more extraordinary. So um, maybe just a few bars into that. Um, 71, maybe? <laughs> Beautiful. Just sometimes, just the accompanying figures I find are not quite in the world of everything else. So, um, do you mind if I? Do? So, just the, even the left hand here. I th it's, we always need to shape these accompanying figures. I think it, it, it's easy that it just becomes a sort of um, generic sort of staccato. But I think um, can we play the, just this? Um, oh, let's play seventy-one again. <laughs> Yeah, just, just that we always shape, like, I mean, as a cellist would, just, just these left-hand figures, I think, that it never becomes sort of automatic. I mean, not, sorry, that's not what you were doing, but I think there was just a, I, I just want sort of even more that we hear the, these basses and that we always sort of shape and we always see, see the direction there. Um, yeah, same thing, please. <laughs> Too vertical, this to kind of I mean, it's just you know, hum, bum, bum. It's still, still got a shape. This phrase, I think, we sometimes sort of forget to. I mean, in a lyrical phrase, we're very aware of you know, the, the shape of the phrase, but we always have to shape. I think it's, it should never be um, so automatic or so vertical. Um, and there's this real sense that now we're we're going towards this sort of little codetta of the. Um, yeah. So um, wherever. Um, yeah. Great, lo lo lots of good things. Um, just uh, even in, uh, say, bar, this phrase which begins bar 110, Yodhi, where we have this Neapolitan harmony, I think still the harmonies can be more extraordinary. You know, it just it, sometimes it feels like you know you've played it uh, and you know how it goes. And actually, the color of that second bar, I mean, whether it's drawn in or, or, or more outward, I, I, I would imagine that being sort of something even more inward, even more tender. And then in the 
in the next phrase, the next harmony produces this huge fortissimo outburst. So I think, um, but it just, uh, and also, yeah, that harmony in 118, somehow, this pianissimo, just something more special, more out of the ordinary. Um, and then, then this, this codetta is sort of as if nothing's happened. We're in E flat major and every, everything is fine. Um, yeah, actually, again, Erica, I think sometimes you're too polite in terms of taking over <laughs> when, when you really have the main voice. I, I think you can, uh, there was somewhere um, like w one, two, six, where I felt actually, you know, I know it's piano, but it's a low register, and I think we have to be all be aware of, of, of where the line's passing. Um, how about 110, and then we'll go on. <laughs> That, I mean, that's so strange. This is so in, in the exposition, you know, we, we go up a semitone and this sort of dropping down and ending up in, well, C flat major, which is notated as B major. That, I mean, that's really weird. And I think we have to realize, you know, this is the development and now it's like anything can happen, you know. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there can be something much more extraordinary, and maybe in terms of the, tie, the space you give. Maybe that's somewhere that you need to dare to delay as long as you possibly dare, you know, just. Yeah, so th no one can breathe, you know, that sort of sense of holding breath. Um, and then the B major, this such a remote key, just that, that definitely needs to be a color we haven't heard, you know, just, yeah. Um, straight on there, straight on there. <laughs> It's be beautiful, the transition, but then, uh, again, your left hand, I feel, is too uh, with, without, without shape. Yum, yum, yeah. I think if you imagine how a string player would play that, those two crotches, because there, there's no staccato and things, so I think probably something yum, yum, a little more brushed. That, that's a place which I think, um, in terms of balance, is, is arguably slightly problematic because I think I just love to hear these, the, the, the transition, and at the moment I'm hearing a lot of which I, probably Beethoven would have done the same as well. I'm sure he wouldn't have cared very much about letting the strings through. But I think in terms of what we want our ear to hear, I think, again, you know, repeated chords, I think we can get sort of very overexcited, but it still has to have shape, even if it's the same note repeated six times. It still has a phrase and a, and a shape. So I think just not to go ever go into a sort of automatic mode of just all chords being equal. <laughs>
I, I could have more of this in a cello line. So I, I think I just love these sort of snake-like lines and this, all this chromaticism. I think is so expressive. So I think that's the element I would love to. Just yeah. I mean, I think by this point we know we're going we're going back. To, uh, and then of course the the big surprise is in the in the recapitulation instead of being piano as we are at the start, we have this huge um, huge return. So. Um, yeah, but this sort of fate-like, um, with this this yom pom 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 for this pedal. Just I think there's this sense that we're going back to this dark place. Um, it was very charming how you did the A flat before, which I think is is wonderful. You know that. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's inviting. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to go from there? <laughs> of wonderful things. Um, this, I mean, it's such a surprise. So having had this contrast with the opening of the recap when we have this fortissimo statement of the thing we heard in piano, I mean, then an even bigger surprise, I think, is then exactly we suddenly end up in C major um, with the cello taking the melody, which, uh, as we've said, is already a, a, a surprise probably to, to the public at that time. Um, so somehow that shift can be even more magical. And again, Yi Ching, I think you just, the one sort of most general thing I would say is just make sure you take as much care over the accompanying figures uh, as, as over the melodies. I think even here, just the way you set that up and the, and the, the texture and the color you create there just is so much of the music. And I think we often just sort of see repeated notes and we go into something slightly more automatic, but always that we shape, shape repeated notes and find the, find the contours within those, those accompaniments, I think. Um, to really give, to give the cellist a, a chance to sort of sit on this. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe straight on the recapitulation and then... <laughs> I think more bass. This cello line is really, I think, where I really want to be drawn. Um, yeah. Um, and it's, it's sort of wonderful having the second subject coming back in this, this kind of more tragic minor. So everything's sort of shifted. And it's, um, do you want to go straight on there? 262, two maybe.
Yeah, bravo. And I think always, you know, I, I think you did do this, but, you know, a row of four sports senders, I think there's also something cumulative, but that they're not ever all the same. There's, yeah, this sort of tension is building unbearably.
Thank you. It's such beautiful music, isn't it? And um, yeah, I mean, lots, lots of beautiful things from, from all of you. Um, what, what are the biggest challenges for you in, in this movement? What, what are the things you're thinking about? I find it very uh, difficult to understand his phrase, phrase basically. Comedy. How he uh, writes it with the upbeat. Yeah. Uh huh. I, and then I find that that always, I haven't really understood why he writes it like that. And, uh, why is Yeah. Oh, interesting. I hadn't really thought about it. And it, <laughs> did, it, did, it never bothered me at any point. Okay, <laughs> like, so obviously what you're doing is quite convincing. I think it's just... There's something sort of so... Open. open it, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. No, it's just, um, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Just how to bow it and a little bit of technical. I mean, I yeah. think it... It should sound very simple, this, actually, yeah, in a way. Yeah. And I mean, the... the, the as often in minor key works, I think that the function of this major key slow movement is to, to provide some repose and some um, rest from the intensity. You know, as we know that, well, the third movement is quite dark and the, the last movement is amazingly stormy and wild. So this is really the sort of still heart in, in the center. Um, and I think with variation form, I think we always have to remember, you know, about the amazing improvisational skills of Beethoven and and yeah the, the, and also I think that we have to remember he was a big show-off you know he was wanting to make an impact he wanted to be the next sort of great great thing so as well as um, demonstrating you know what he could do compositionally which I think in the variation form is often like a sort of written out improvisation you know he would have improvised variations on a theme it was a sort of standard party trick at the time and he also wanted to be make a big splash as a virtuoso pianist so I think there's a real sense of of delight in the sort of cleverness and the, and the way he develops things. That I almost feel, um, if, if there's one thing I feel about this movement in general, is it, it feels a bit serious. That I think you could take more joy in, in the charm of it and the sort of cleverness of, of all the things he's doing um, with this theme. Um, actually, one thing I wanted to say, just in the, the, the theme itself, um, I almost felt it, there's something very sort of hymn-like about it and very sort of simple. And I almost felt you were sort of working harder than you needed to, to, to project it outwards. And actually, what, you know, we spend so long thinking about projecting things and actually drawing people in and creating something really still is uh, uh, equally, and if not more, powerful than that. And I, I thought this... As pianists, you know, we, we, we spend so long trying to make a singing tone and not, not to be like a piano, but to be like a singer or to be like a string player. But here is, is one place I felt you were maybe working too hard to be cantable. And maybe, I think I'm writing something, he, he transcribed this for string quintet later on. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and it made me think, actually, the, the, the variations that... Uh, the piano in this, it's like, it's like a string duo, really. And when, when the others join, it's like... You know, we're three parts of the string quintet and, and they're one each. So I think if you can sort of imagine this kind of, yeah, like, like five string players rather than sort of being too piano -y. I mean, I think as pianists, we, we always want to emulate string players and wind players and singers anyway. But this is one place where I thought, yeah, it was a little too piano singy for me. And then if the, if the theme is, is more inward and, and slightly simpler, then the first variation, which is much more operatic, can, then that can be the cantabile one. So should, should we try the, the theme? Then? It's beautiful. I think even more, you know, when the strings join, it's really a chance for you to be, I mean, it's mostly a string quartet or even a string trio. And because in that phrase, then at first, 
the cello and the, the left hand of the piano are doubling, probably just to match so that we get this evenness, maybe a little less of that and a little more of the upper voices, just so it really is like an equal string trio texture. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an illusion, obviously, because as the pianist, we can never quite make this string sound, but it has to really feel like we're breathing together like a string quartet, like a string quintet. So um, it's beautiful, the opening there. I mean, I think it could still... Uh, that, that phrase, if you dared, could still remain sort of, you know, even simpler, that it doesn't need to sort of come out so much, maybe that it, it really... Yeah, so once more. Sorry, I won't make you play together. Well, so I think we also have to differentiate between the two halves of the phrase. So this, which is which is very sort of major key, and then the second phrase, this chromatic uh, chromatic rising line. I think we need to really sort of follow that through more. So there is something more um, far-reaching about that second half of the phrase. That it, it's such a sort of contrast somehow that we then have that. Um, Anyway, the, um, do you want to go on for now? And then I think this can immediately be this is really operatic. So, so we, it's like we've come from this sort of hymn-like setting, something uh, almost uh, religious about it. And then, then this is really the opera house and something much more outward and, um, and expressive, yeah. I love, actually, in Beethoven, when the violin becomes the bass. I mean, I think that's one of his favorite things. I, I, I think you can maybe be more, more bass-like, more aware that that's your role at that point. And I think, as, as pianists, I think we need to sometimes just sort of let, you know, lower register strings. It's very easy to, to, to obscure when we're in the same register. So I think that's something we always have to be mindful of. So, uh, and I just, yeah, particularly love this feature of the violin being the bass line. So, um, yeah, well, once more for the second time, maybe that. Beautiful. What character do you think of this variation as having? 
elegant. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Much freer. Freer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's something more exploratory about it, I think. Yeah, yeah. And maybe if we can follow these contours even more, that sure, uh, yeah. again, I, I would say, if anything, it feels a bit too sort of even and equal. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. Just yeah. that we really just follow the ups and downs of sure. the line. Just, um. <laughs> And, and the character of this is. Very funny, no? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. What have you done? Uh, very lively. Like yeah, it's sort of. Yeah, boisterous, kind of playful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe you saying it feels a little heavy, actually, for my. Just for my. And uh, partly because the strings are pizzicato, I think we really want to these. Beep, I mean, and maybe that's something you can do a bit more of as well. But just, I was sort of losing some of the pizzicato. And I thought maybe if. If it was a little lighter, just something, yeah, something more sort of spoken and yeah. <laughs> That's definitely one you can sort of feel Beethoven taking delight in his own brilliance, I think. You know, it's like, oh, look at this. And I think, yeah, both as composer and, uh, and as pianist, he would have really been relishing that. So I think, yeah, not, not to be afraid of just, yeah, really seeking that enjoyment, I think. Um, and then this next one's extraordinary, isn't it? This, I mean, that's really then where suddenly, you know, E flat minor back into this territory we've been in in the first movement. And I think... Um, yeah, again, the, the, the surprise of it being a cello solo, I think, for this really expressive writing and, and um, yeah, this sort of mournful. Um, so I, here, here uh, mournful, yeah, yeah, just, here I just felt you could sort of feel the intervals even more, that we feel the connections between the notes, that we really sort of feel, yeah. Uh, and uh, as pianists, sometimes I feel like intervals are too easy to play, you know, big, and we just sort of, you know, leave it, but actually to really imagine the stretch that string players have to do between, I think sometimes for these very expressive passages, there's something quite sort of sinewy about this, the, the, this variation. And I just thought about the balance. For me, there was a bit much right hand, perhaps, that I think I'd like, I, for me, it's a duo between the cello and, and the left hand of the piano, and this syncopation could maybe be more accompanimental. Um, so should we go straight on that variation? I could still have more, more, more bass, I think. 
it's like a second cello in the, in the quintet. <laughs> Oh, but this needs to be much more. I think this is the first pianissimo we've had in the movement, isn't it? Maybe, I mean, even if it isn't, then, then you know, th again, it's this real extreme that we're, it, there's a big difference between piano and pianissimo here, I think. Something really inward. And then he writes pianissimo morendo with a, uh, all the way through to the end. So I think this is very much more otherworldly. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I, um, I, I think that could be even more playful and even more sort of spirited and like, but it, it's beautiful. But then I think there's something about the way you, you this interrupted cadence, you know, this when, when we're heading into the coda. It's forte piano in the, in the violin part, isn't it? And then nothing, but it just, it, it didn't quite feel like the right sort of forte piano. I think that it's, it's something more expressive rather than a sort of shock. There's a, yeah, just, just something about that C minor harmony. And then, this extraordinary coda where, you know, it's the theme but reharmonized in this chromatic way. And again, pianissimo, right? So I think, yeah, something much more ghostly and, and uh, otherworldly again. It, it, it's a very different thing from, you know, if he just brought the theme back at the end. It's, yeah, it, it's something very different. And I guess really bringing in the chromaticism, which is so much a feature of the other, the other movements of this piece and, and the minor sections, but bringing it into the major which I think is such an amazing expressive device uh, before, before the sun comes out again. Um, how about just the, well, the, maybe the second half of Variation 5 for the second time and then go on. It just feels too real somehow. Just the
as if nothing's happened. It's kind of amazing the way it just, uh, yeah, he's such a master at these disappearing endings. Of course, the whole piece fades into nothing as well. I mean, it's the, the, almost the last surprise of all is this, this ending. So I'm sorry we don't have time for the other two movements. Just for those who don't know, there's this amazing um, sort of half minuet, half scherzo, I think, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Third. And then this brilliantly fiery and, and, and dramatic yeah, yeah, yeah. prestissimo. So again, the sort of extremes come back yeah, yeah. before it all fades into nothing at the end. But yeah. um, no, it's really such a, a great pleasure to hear you all, and really, really wonderful playing. And, and please do go and hear this wonderful trio in their, their two concerts, because you'll hear the rest of the piece. Thank you.